And our first speaker this morning is a licensed clinical social worker with a private practice specializing in trauma, addiction, and anxiety. She is the host of the Confident Sober Woman podcast. She wrote about her experience living in sobriety in her real, raw, and honest memoir, Recovering in Recovery, The Life-Changing Joy of Sobriety. She has been sober since 2002, and her journey has led her to help countless other women recover their lives, their hopes, and their futures. Please welcome to the stage for her talk, The Truth About the Lies You Believe, Shelby John. Imagine you're out of town at a big conference in your field. You woke up this morning, you slipped on a long, flowy, comfortable sundress and some cute sandals, and you came to the conference. Probably had some coffee, maybe a bagel, and you picked the seat you wanted to view the session from. You enjoyed the first speaker. You probably checked your email, maybe texted your kids, good morning. It's really just a typical day at a conference. And then, over the loudspeaker, you hear your name. It's a bit shocking at first because you aren't expecting to hear your name at this conference. So you perk up, listen in, there it is again. You are being paged to come to the lobby outside this room. You have no idea why they'd be paging you. So of course you get up and walk out and there are two policemen and some official conference staff waiting for your arrival. I don't have to imagine that. I lived that 20 years ago. That's exactly what happened to me at a conference in Washington, DC with hundreds of other social workers and foster care youth present as a direct result of my addiction. I was whisked away to a city police department I was interrogated by detectives who did not believe me, and I spent 72 hours in a jail cell. And I had no idea why. That was the bottom for me. Amazingly, the legal details took care of themselves, but left me standing alone at a conference where I was the helper, drenched in the overwhelming reality that the person who most needed the help was me. And it started with seeing the truth about the lies I believed. And as it turns out, they're the same lies that most women believe about themselves. And that's when I realized that recovery is not a one-size-fits-all experience. Lasting recovery starts with identifying the lies you believe. And in my professional experience, there are five lies most women believe about themselves. Lie number one, I'm not good enough. When I was five years old, my biological father left our family. I can remember him kneeling down, looking at me through those dark rimmed glasses, his forehead glowing where the hairline had receded. He looked like a giant. In that moment, he changed the trajectory of my life with a trauma that forged the path for so many of the lies I believed about myself for decades. He said he was going to my grandmother's house to chop wood, and he never came back. I felt abandoned, not good enough for even my own father. He remarried, had two sons, and left my sister and I behind. We would call, but he would not pick up. We would visit, but he was never around. The abandonment by my biological father created the trauma neuropathway that I was not enough, not worthy of his love. And I can't help but wonder if it's because his other two children were boys. Line number two, I have to put other people's needs first. Women are taught to put their needs to the side and take care of everybody else before they ever even think about taking care of themselves. We have to be all things to everyone and have a toned body and a positive attitude. <laughs> your husband, kids, even your job come before your needs. 
we think self-care is selfish. But what's the first thing they tell you when you get on an airplane? If the oxygen mask drops, put your mask on first and then help your loved ones. Ladies, I want you to listen to the flight attendant. Line number three, feelings are weakness. When I was a young mom, I wanted to share what I thought were common struggles in raising young children. But whenever I did, all I got were glassy-eyed stares in return. Some moms even said, no, that's never happened to me. Or, gosh, I can't relate to that. And that just reinforced the perception that my life was not in order, that I was a big hot mess, and that most women were doing all of this much better than me. What I learned was, we don't say things like that here. But behind closed doors, they lived the reality of their own lives, which was likely much different than what they showed in the preschool drop-off line. Line number four, that's a woman's job. When you were growing up, you might have heard things like, you can't do that because you're a girl, or that's a boy's job. We see this in sports, corporate America, and in regular families doing ordinary things like washing dishes, laundry, or chopping wood. We make these gender identifications regarding men and women based on the belief of the lies that women can't, won't, or don't like certain things. But many women do embrace traditional roles, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with wanting to be a mom or work at a high level or hang out with your girlfriends. Where the lie derails you is when people tell you what you can or should do based on your gender and you believe it. And line number five, I don't have a choice. Women will stay in bad marriages, unfulfilling jobs, and toxic relationships because they believe they don't have a choice. Not true. We always have a choice in how we respond. We always have a choice in how we show up. No matter what your life circumstances, you always have a choice. The lies are like quicksand. They slowly suck you down into idle helplessness. They keep you stuck on the couch, scrolling through social media and sending emojis off to people you don't even know and calling it emotional connection. You know the things you should be doing, but you're not doing them. You should be going for a walk with your girlfriends, but what you're really gonna do is go get a Chick-fil-A milkshake. <laughs> and I know I'll get up off the couch for that. For me, it was a downward spiral in active addiction. The year before I got sober, I had my second suicide attempt. I was lost and stuck and living in lies. And that made it easy for alcohol to keep me in a grip stronger than a hawk's talons. See, that's the impact of the lies. The brain holds on to these beliefs like a child holds an adult's hand, afraid to let it go. We get stuck. And fear is the ultimate quicksand. When you're stuck and afraid, you lose control of your life. That combination that desperation is what led me to that second suicide attempt. But let's face it, folks, I'm still here. I did get unstuck. I did take control of my life. And I found a pathway that any woman can follow. So how exactly do we get unstuck? Well, fortunately, there is a better way for women in recovery today. It took me years to figure out what doesn't work. We just have so many more options today than we did 20 years ago. Now, I got sober in AA, and I wouldn't trade it for the world. But 12-step programs are not the only way. In fact, after you've spent some time working in these kinds of programs, you tend to long for more. There's a craving for a different kind of growth, a different kind of recovery. The first thing we need to do is eliminate the negative thinking patterns that were developed and created over time due to past trauma and life experiences, and then carried with us into adulthood. But what do we mean eliminate them? Well, for years I didn't actually think I could get rid of them, 
I kind of thought this was my new normal. I was sober, but I still kind of hated myself. And thankfully, I learned that is not true, that when we do the work of emotional sobriety, we begin to recognize when these negative thoughts occur, why they happen, and how to reverse them. Daily habits and routines we know are critical for building success, and the most valuable of these is the morning routine. Those activities you do every single day and never deviate from. When you start your day off with specific habits and routines, you train your brain to know that you honor and respect yourself. This can be things like prayer, meditation, exercise. It's really whatever works for you. We don't know what the rest of the day will bring. So that time you can spend with yourself in the morning is invaluable. So just take one thing to get started with. I suggest get rid of the snooze button. <laughs> Create some space for yourself in the morning because success starts there. Next, you need to discover your personal core values. When you get sober and start doing this work, you need to know what matters to you. What are the most important things? Those are your true values. For example, one of my core values is vitality. All things health, wellness, aging gracefully, and living with relative happiness. Really treating myself with the respect I deserve. So when I find myself standing in front of my kitchen pantry, gorging myself on pretzel nuggets, my brain knows I'm not living according to my core values. And then symptoms like anxiety show up. And lastly, we need to harness the energy of a spiritual connection. Energy is all around us. The world is made up of energy. So the pathway to recovery has to include tapping into that energy. Now I'm not here to tell you what to believe, and this is not about religion. This is about the energy of the truth versus the energy of the lies. And you've been living in lies. But once you realize your personal core values, you discover the energy of your truth. And just because you've been living in lies does not mean that has to continue. You can always restart. And that means identifying the lie or lies that are running your life. So come on, let's do it right now. What is one lie that is running your life right now? <laughs> do you remember some of mine? <laughs> I'm not good enough, and I have to put other people's needs first. I showed you mine. Now be honest and show yourself yours. And whatever those lies are, these four pillars will help bring you back to your truth. Eliminating negative thinking patterns. Transforming daily habits and routines. Discovering your personal core values and harnessing the energy of a spiritual connection. Ladies, I want you to commit to these four pillars, and they will retrain your brain and heal the neuropathways that years of active addiction have damaged. Now I have reclaimed my life, and I've gotten out of the pit of despair and active addiction. But it is not Disney World. It is real and raw and vulnerable and painful, and joyful, and serene. When you stop living in lies, you still have to clean your house, and pay your bills, and argue with your kids. When you stop living in lies, you get reacquainted with the power of making your own choices, the power of feeling all of life, the power of being vulnerable, the power of living in your truth. And my truth is, I'm an alcoholic who's no longer living in lies. And that is the greatest freedom in the world. Shelby John!